recognize this day as being 911, 12th anniversary of that fateful day. I remember, uh, I think I was still sleeping, and my wife came and said, you should see this, you should see this. The plane just flew into the World Trade Center. And of course, at that time, we were thinking of Cessna accident. And while I come out of the bedroom, and just as I turn to look at the TV, uh, I'm looking at the TV, and we see the second plane coming into uh, the building. And we recognize that was a full-size plane. So it's like, okay, this isn't an accident. You know? And then, of course, very quickly, uh, the word came that there was one down in Philadelphia, another one heading for the Pentagon. And we knew the jig was up. We were in for it. And uh, it's been 12 years, and uh, we have been fighting that battle for a long time. And uh, so we just wanted to pause today to remember uh, our family. Uh, of course, my wife and I uh, had at that time uh, West Coast Christian School. And I told you the story before. Uh, we actually had a dad from our school was on that second plane. We had no idea at the moment we were watching. We just thought we were watching news. What we were really watching was the destruction of a family, the destruction of a home, uh, when uh, that dad was taken away. Uh, he uh, had contacted me just a few weeks before and uh, was letting me know he was going to surprise his son. He was coming home to surprise his son uh, to be there with him. And uh, his son who attended our high school and uh, never made it. And that they didn't find out for a day or so later that uh, he was in that plane. They couldn't contact him anywhere. And then uh, finally the airline contacted him and gave him the news that he was indeed on that plane. So it had some very personal uh, moments for us uh, on that day. And so, Father, we thank you for uh, our nation. Uh, we wish, dear Father, that you were the nation closer to you. We wish, dear Father, that. Uh, you can somehow wake her up. Father, we uh, thank you that you have watched over, protected us, and kept us, Father, through all of this. And Father, not only for our nation and those who suffered loss, we ask, Lord, that you continue, particularly those of your children, those who are Christians who are suffering such a hard loss. Many of them lost children in the daycare center that was in that building. I don't know, Father, if you could ever get over the loss of a child, but I pray for those people. The so Lord should just be there with them. We will be anointed as we pray for them. Continue, Father, to bless that mission. Continue, Father, to bless our missionary friends in Mexico, as well as India, and Father, in the Philippines, too. Continue, Father, to uh, guide, direct, and lead your work. Bless this your work here in Ontario, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles, open them up to uh, the book of Kings, 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 7 this evening, 2 Kings chapter 7. If we have a chance, we'll get into chapter 8, but right now, I want you to take a look at chapter uh, uh, 7 of 2 Kings, and uh, really the verse I was going to take is found in verse 9. But before I get there, let me back up and tell you the story. It's funny because this story could easily find its way into the news today. We have the Syrian army. I don't know if you've watched the news, but the Syrian army is in the news today. And so here we are dealing again in this ancient book with the same people, the Syrian army. And the Syrian army has come down into Damas uh, out of Damascus and come down into the area known as Samaria. Now, Samaria, initially, you and I knew that as the uh, nation of Israel. Remember when the nation divided, the ten northern tribes uh, were referred to themselves as Israel, and the two southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah referred to themselves as Judea or Judah. And so uh, the northern tribe, those ten tribes that, that were once called Israel, are already now, by the time of the second kings here, being referred to as Samaria. What happened to them? Well, the Assyrians came in and assimilated a lot of their land. 
By the time the Syrians and the Assyrians come through, uh, Samaria is pretty much taken over. It uh, has a responsibility to pay taxes to Assyria, and, and, and uh, so will the Syrians. It's about to fold. It's about to be lost forever. We often refer to the ten lost tribes of Israel. They're not lost to God, because if you read Revelation, he mentions the tribes. Uh, but they are lost to history. And uh, it, they, they disappeared into what's called the Caucasus Mountains. That's up around the Turkey area up there, just below the uh, Red, uh, I'm sorry, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, around that area. And the strange thing is, about the same time that the Israelites disappeared, they went into the Caucasus Mountains and we never saw them again. On this side, out of the Caucasus Mountain, come a group of people known as the Celts. And the Celts would eventually land in the area we know, that they land in the area called Ireland, as we would call it. Okay. So, uh, a lot of you, you, you'll hear people from time to time uh, talk about uh, Israel and England. And they will connect them together. And the reason they do is they connect them through these Celtic people. Of course, you know, the Irish and the uh, Scottish people are referred to as the Celtic people or Celtics. And uh, if you're a Boston fan, the Boston Celtics. It's, uh, many people uh, tie them to those ten northern tribes. But the land itself of Israel, uh, in the day and time which we are reading here, they are being referred to as... Samaria. Now, in the time of Jesus, of course, we know the Samaritans, that's where the woman came at the well. And she was the one who said to Jesus, what are you, a Jew, doing talking to me? Why are you talking to me? Uh, you say we have to go to Jerusalem to worship. Well, remember the history. Everybody worshipped in Jerusalem. But when they split the ten nations, the king of Israel said, listen, if we keep going down to Jerusalem, pretty soon everybody will leave us and they'll go to Jerusalem. So they established their own uh, worship in the land. And that way people could stay here and worship. And uh, they developed uh, a worship of their own God. And, of course, the Lord judged them harshly uh, for doing that. And uh, so as we take a look at historically, we come to this area. There's really three verses I want you to look at. Verse 2, verse 6, and then finally verse 9. I want you to see the question. Now the prophet in verse 1 says, Elijah is talking. And he says, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel. This ring bother me. Uh, can you hear me? Not now. Without it, no? You, you need this ringing to hear me? I don't hear you. Please hear me. You can hear me okay? Alright, because that, that ringing is just driving me nuts. So. Thank you. <laughs> I can hear. I can hear. And so, and Elijah said, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour will be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. I mean, this is where they're at. Okay. Now, then a Lord, or a, I think in some translations it says a, uh, a captain. A captain on whom the king leaned, or a person that the king trusted in. He answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, and this is the prophet now talking again, Elisha, Behold, thou shalt see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat thereof. I want you to underline that part, the word of the Lord. I want you to notice how accurately God's about to answer his word. Fine flour for a shekel, two barley for a shekel. Now, I want you to see that. And then note the promise to the antagonist. Tomorrow you'll see this, but you won't eat of it. 
That's a pretty specific promise that God has made. He didn't just say tomorrow you'll have flour. But He even told the price of the flour. He didn't just say tomorrow you'll have barley, but He told them the price of the barley. That's pretty accurate stuff that God is laying down. See, God always, when He gives His Word, He gives it in some specific way that you can either prove or disprove Him. For example, tomorrow comes, and all of a sudden people say, Hey, I got fine flour for $3. God's Word's no good. Because God didn't just say they'd have flour. He told the price that the flour would be going for. He's always very specific. Whenever God deals with His Word, He says, here is how you can prove this is Me. This is how you will prove this is My Word. We're, you know, some religions say you can't question their Word. God says, prove My Word. Here's what I'm saying. I did this. I did this. I did this. I left this footprint. I left this fingerprint. I left this telltale sign that I was here. Now look at it and see if I, that didn't happen. He always gives something. For example, when Jesus came into the world, God says He would be a Nazarene. They even told us His name. God's with us. They told us everything about Him. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would be visited by men from the east. He would have a virgin mother. He would be, have to escape a terrible tragedy and go down to Egypt. He, when he comes back from Egypt, he's not going to stay in Bethlehem. He's not going to go to Jerusalem, but he's going to go all the way up here to a little area called Galilee of the Gentiles, and that's where he's going to grow up. And then, and it's very specific, all the way to the cross, how he would die on Golgotha's hill. All of it laid out for us. No mistake who Jesus is. It was said that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And how many times have I said to you, listen, if the devil wanted to win, all he had to do was to sell him for 29. Sell him for 31. Hey, tell you what, I'll give you 50 shekels for that information you gave us about Jesus. Thank you very much. 50. I'll, I'll double the money. Devil put one right then and there. But you've got to remember, this has never been a battle against God and the devil. As I've told you so many times, when God finally says it's time to lock the devil away, He sends just an angel. He doesn't say the angel of the Lord. He doesn't say an angel. He says He told an angel, go lock him up. The angel says, all right, just a common guy. Locks up the devil. What kind of power is that? That angel is working on the authority of God. There is no competition. You've got to get that kind of thought pattern out of your head that there's some kind of war between God and the devil. And oh, okay, granted, he's got one third of the host of heaven are going to follow him. But he can have all of heaven and just God leave God there by himself. Guess who's still going to win? Angels are created beings. Created by God. And all he has to say is, hey, you know what? You don't exist anymore. And boom, they're all gone. There's nothing they can do about it. They can't arrest him. They can't take him to court. They can't do nothing to God. He's God. And you have to get back into your mindset that this is not a struggle between the devil and God. And oh, what if we can't overpower? Hey, listen, that's why he said the gates of hell can't prevail against you. If you keep beating on them and beating on them with prayer, they're going to crumble. I don't care what the devil may have stolen and walked away from you. If you keep banging away with prayer, those are going to come crum uh, crumbling down and you will ultimately succeed. The problem is most of us quit before we get there. We're not good fighters. We're not good fighters. We're not in it for the long haul. And that's why we don't see the victory that we should see. But look at this question the man says. If God were to open the windows of heaven, maybe what you said could happen. Maybe. How often did we see Jesus do something because someone in the crowd said, well, I don't believe you could do that. Well, if you were God, then you wouldn't just forgive their sins. You'd heal them. Jesus said, hey, excuse me. I wasn't intending on healing you today. I was just forgiving your sins. But because that man over there is questioning, would you get up and walk? I'm glad that antagonist was in the crowd because that man is walking because that man said, you can't make him walk. If 
God broke the windows of heaven. Now I want you to go to verse 6. Drop down to verse 6. What's God going to do? You're going to see Him opening windows in heaven. In verse 6, God begins, there is a famine. The Syrian army has surrounded Samaria. They have surrounded the entire city and they're starving these people out. No food, no help, nothing. The king is starving right along the rest of the people. There isn't anything. They're talking about boiling their own children and eating them. The dead children. Mothers are fighting because, hey, we boiled my child yesterday and now she won't let us boil her child today. It's a very desperate time. That's the time, and there's the prophet of God in Jerusalem, or in this particular city, it's not Jerusalem, it's in this city in Samaria, along with everybody else. If this country suffers, we all suffer right along with it. When America went broke, did you go broke too? Sure. Yeah. We suffer the calamity that the nation suffers. We're in it with them. It might be, though, that God speaks to us. It might be that God sends a portion for us that our oil doesn't run out. But we're affected like everybody else is. Our people in, our, in this church had as much difficulty getting a job as anybody else did. Michael's not here tonight because he's working. Praise the Lord. They change his hours from 1 o'clock to 9 o'clock. He will get up till 9 o'clock tonight. But he's grateful he's got a job. When the economy goes south, it goes south on all of us. And so here it is. But look at, go down to verse 6. I like this. For the Lord made the host of Syria to hear a noise. The Lord made, and I just put there, windows in heaven. The Syrian army suddenly here, they're minding their own business, they're camped out, they've got the Israelites now trapped in their city. They've surrounded them, and all of a sudden, they're sitting there at twilight, just as the sun begins to set. They begin to hear the sound of horses and chariots. And it sounds like a huge army coming after them. They don't get their chariots, they don't get their horses, they don't get their food. They take off running back to Syria. They leave everything behind. Everything is left. What was God doing there? With nobody in the city was helping, they, did the folks in the city do anything? No. God was crying open a window in heaven. God will find a way to bless you, even when there is no way visible. You've got to get this. You've got to see this. Now, think of your worst. Think of the thing that you're praying for the hardest. And if I was to say to you, tomorrow God's going to give you that, you'd say, I don't know how, Pastor. I don't see how a thing like that can happen. You don't have to see how. See, that's the problem. You want to see how it's going to happen. You want to be able to say to God, God, if you do this, this would happen. And I'd appreciate it. Lord, we need new views in our church. If you'd let me win the lottery, I'd promise to buy new views. And God said, well, I ain't going to let you have the lottery. But thank God, how am I ever going to get new views? Hey, it's not your job to get new views. It's mine. You let me worry about the details of it. But no, you don't get no lottery. Right? But we, see, we want to say to God, if you give me this, then I can do that. God said, I don't need you. Listen, I cried open that window of heaven without anybody in Samaria helping me whatsoever. Now, he's going to send some witnesses because God doesn't do anything without wanting everybody to know he did it. Go back to the city. And at the gate, there are four lepers. And these four lepers begin to talk to each other in about uh, verse 8. And they say, listen, we're going to starve to death here. You know, we can't even go into the city because we're lepers. No one's going to let us in the city. 
and no one's bringing us any food. We're starving here as a deal. We can go into the city and starve with the rest of the people because there's no food. Or we could go down to the Syrian camp and say, we surrender, we surrender. And maybe they'll give us some food and maybe they'll kill us. But hey, what do we got to lose? We'll either die here with the Syrians or we'll die up here for sure. But at least we got a 50-50 chance that maybe they'll throw us some bread. So the four lepers start to walk down toward the camp. They get to the first tent and they don't see or hear a single person. So they walk into the first tent and there's food in the tent. They start picking out on all this food. Then they realize, wow, the, Samar the, the Syrians left gold and silver behind. So they grab the gold, the silver, the nice clothes. They probably went to an officer's tent. And they go off somewhere and they hide the clothes and they hide the money and they hide a little bit of food and then they come into another tent and they start to pick out all over again. Oh, look at this. And someone says, hey, you know what? We can't do this. We can't keep this. Look at verse 9. This is where verse 9 comes into play. And they said one to another, We do not well. Listen, we're not doing a good thing here. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king and his household. This is a day of good tidings. And the problem with so many of us is we don't recognize the good tidings. We think it's our blessing and we keep it to us. And we hoard the gold and we eat the food. We say, oh, them poor folks up on the hill. I sure wish they were here. Well, if you go tell them, they'd probably come. Oh, but this is so good. And so there we are, gorging on the good things of God and not telling another soul. I remember when I got saved, it was the greatest news I ever heard. I could have kept the whole gospel all to myself. I could have read this book from cover to cover and kept it all to me. It was that delicious. But guess what happened as soon as I read it? You don't get very far in Matthew before God says, go and tell. You don't get very far in Luke before God says, go and tell. You don't get very far into John before he says, go tell. And although I could have kept the goodness of the gospel all to myself, God said, go and tell. I could have been like those guys. Hey, we could hide some of this gold and some of this silver and some of this fine clothes. We could just go from tent to tent to tent and eat forever. And then finally someone said, listen, I think God put us here for a reason. This is a day of good tidings. This is a day of glad tidings. When I got saved with the day of glad tidings, it wasn't just for me to keep, it was for me to share. When you get a blessing, that's what makes Wednesday night so wonderful. When we come down here and say, hey, the Lord did this. Amen. Like this brother over in India. He could have kept it all to himself. He didn't have the right to tell us that we got that generator over there that you and I were praying for. And we'd still be saying, God, you lousy creator, you ain't giving them that there generator. And we've been pleading and praying for it. Or we could have sat there and said, God, they were praying for 80 kids and bless God, we don't know how many they are. I'm glad they told us there's 92. We were praying for 80 and God gave 92. 12, too many. God takes a look back. <laughs> right? And so, that's the thing. When God answers your prayer, it's a day of good tidings and we share it with people. When God saved your soul, you take that gospel and you share it with people. Tonight we were able to share and, and encourage one another. Yes, we take prayer requests, but you watch our Wednesday nights. More than half of it is praise report. There's always some praise to go with that prayer. Oh, God did this, and so I'm going to pray for that. That's what God has begun to do with this church, is begin to give us more and more and more. We were talking, what a wonderful blessing Sunday was. You know, everybody, the great thing about it was everybody stayed over there and fellowship forever. You could not, and I'm not kidding, like 2 o'clock, say, hey, folks, go home. Get out. Go the door. You know, everybody wanted to stay and visit, and it was wonderful. I was sitting there with uh, uh, Louise and her daughter, and I was sitting there earlier, I was with uh, uh, the, the, the wires and, and got that. But Louise was saying, you know, 
first time I visited your church, he said, you probably don't remember this, it was a funeral for a friend of uh, Ella, uh, asked if we could have a funeral here for one of the ladies in our building. She said, that was the first time I ever came. She said, and I remember when I left that building, I told Ella, that's the man I want to do my funeral. She said, Ella always said, you know, why don't you go to church? Why don't you? She said, for, I never came for a long, long time. She said, I don't know what I was waiting for. I'm so glad I came. Grew up as a young Catholic lady, gave her heart to Jesus right there. Remember, she walked that aisle not long ago. Turned her heart right there to Jesus. And now, well, she just telling me. See, those are the good tidings. And those are things that we share with one another. And uh, we have the joy of sharing with each other. So I remind you that this is a day of good tidings. It may look as the morning begins to break that it is a day of impossibility. In the morning, everybody said, we're starving to death. And the prophet said, I'm telling you this, by tomorrow, by tomorrow, you will have so much bread, it'll, I'm telling you, my mother used to get 10 loaves for a dollar when we were kids. You know? And I mean, we thought it was great when you got five loaves for a dollar, but when you got those, boy, let me tell you, we bought them loaves. And we'd just be eating that bread. Eating that bread. Ten loaves for a dollar. Didn't have anything to go with it, but we had bread. <laughs> I mean, it was cheap. If you could go to the store today, you went into Stater Brothers, and they said, 10 loaves for a dollar. You would think you went to heaven. And you'd say, well, I don't think that can happen anymore. And if God said to you tomorrow, I'm telling you, Stater Brothers can be selling bread, 10 loaves for a dollar. You'd say, I don't believe that can happen. But then God would find a, wind, a way to open a window in heaven. Because some captain of the host said, I don't think that can happen. If God opened windows in heaven, maybe, maybe, how often in our prayers do people put a maybe with what God can do? If this can happen, then maybe. I'm telling you, there is no maybe. If God wants it to happen, and look at how accurate, well, we didn't, we didn't finish reading it, but let me tell you the story. That captain, who the prophet said to him, I'm going to tell you this, you're going to see it, but you won't eat it. When all the people heard that there was food out there in the Syrian camp, the captain was standing there at the gate, and the people all came running past him, knocked him over, trampled him to death. You don't want to doubt God, bottom line. The second thing is don't get in the way of hungry people. <laughs> they will stop you to death. Okay? And so here he was, and the prophet said to him, listen, not only will you, you, you'll see it, you'll see it happen, but you won't eat any of the bread. Oh, he saw it happen. All of a sudden, everybody's going out to get the free food. Free food! Never tasted a bit of it. Heard it? Never tasted it. We hear that God does wonderful things in the Bible, but you're not tasting it. Because you're putting that maybe in there. Maybe. I'm telling you, the blessings of God taste good. Get rid of the maybe. Start eating. Father, thank you for this story tonight out of your book. And Father, might we learn not to put a maybe. But if you say it, we believe it, that's it. And Lord, you have given us a great number of promises in your word. And we believe you for them. And Father, also help us to remember that these are days of glad tidings. And help us, Father, even on our worst day, our glad tidings is Jesus saved. Help us to share that with people. In Jesus' name.